This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. And by Ledger, makers of the best hardware security devices. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to LedgerWallet.com to see the full range of products and use the code EPICENTER at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have a very special guest for you, Stefan Tuval, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Slockit and one of the people who kind of triggered the, the DAO. So before we start, let's have an intro from Stefan. Stefan, a bit about your background and how you got interested in this space. Sure. Hey, guys. Um, hello, everyone. So a bit of background. Well, um, I got interested in the space because I was sick and tired of working for my previous employer. Uh, <laughs> simple as that, uh, where some of the best minds in their generation were working to sell 2% more shampoo on you know some shelf in White Rose or Asda or Walmart. Um, and I thought that was really depressing. I had an interest in Bitcoin um, and cryptocurrencies in general. I was really um, enticed by the Mike Hearn speech at the um, uh, uh, Venice, I think it was, during Complete Festival. Um, and I, I highly recommend you guys watch this. And it was all about, you know, autonomous cars and things of that nature, cars that buy cars. And I thought, that sounds crazy. I need to get into this. It sounds like the future. So I got into it a little bit. I started a, a, a crypto consulting company, heard about Ethereum and the white paper uh, around Christmas 2013. Like everyone else, I just uh, my mind was just blown by how smart Vitalik was and by how interesting this project was. And I did everything I could to join. So that's how I joined Ethereum uh, two and a half years ago. Then I left Ethereum to start Slockit. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about today. It's funny you mentioned that uh, Mike Hearn talk and how how it's become such an iconic talk when people talk about um, smart contracts and they just sort of describe it to a, a, a person who doesn't really know anything about it. How that talk gets gets brought up over and over and over and, and I I've certainly uh, spoken to people and like you know, sort of re re gave that talk to people trying to explain what a smart contract would be. Right. And uh, yeah, so I mean, you were actually one of our first guests. You were on episode sixteen, which was was I wow. ages ago? And uh, back then, you were working at Ethereum as the as the chief communications officer. And you know, this is now your new gig. But uh, yeah, welcome back. And it's, uh, it, thank you, it's, and, it's, and thank you for paying attention to Ethereum back then. Not many people did, you know. Well, I mean, I remember when we first heard about it. I mean, Brian had told me about it. It's like. Yeah, there's this kid and he wrote this paper and like he's 19 and then you know we read the papers and he, the, the first thing that came to my mind was what the hell was i doing when i was 19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. uh cool well um let's uh maybe talk about uh well let's lock it obviously i mean that's what you're here to talk about tell us uh what is lock it and well I mean, first of all, so there there are multiple things we want to talk about. But we don't want to talk about we want to talk about Slocket and we want to talk about the DAO as well. Um, so give us a broad introduction to those two concepts, those two different entities. Sure. Um, well, Slocket is a, a a company which purposes to create autonomous objects in order to reduce operating costs for corporates. So, for example, if you had um, 10,000 objects talking to each other to scale to 100,000 objects talking to each other via a centralized server. You wouldn't just need to buy 10 times more servers. You need um, exponential cost um, increase in terms of your DevOps, in terms of um, you know the infrastructure that's required to maintain all this. And then scaling to a billion objects is just pure impossible today. Um, well, at least as of today. So with blockchain technology and in particular Ethereum, what we're capable of is having all those objects synchronize around a shared blockchain state, so to speak, and considerably reduce operating costs, throw away centralized servers in certain cases for clients. Um, and that's uh, what Slockit is in a nutshell. It's a company that's registered in Germany, um, currently a, a small business. We got uh, five people as part of the team right now. Um, and as part of the project, uh, we thought about, hey, you know, this technology would be awesome for the sharing economy. 
and we could have objects that rent themselves and pass on the cost savings, if you will, to the people renting these places. And that opened all sorts of ideas around decentralized insurance and decentralized cleaning services and things of that nature. Um, so in order to, to, to fund this project, we thought about starting a DAO and Christoph Jens, uh, the CTO of, um, of Slockit, um, devised this thing that became a framework. And the next thing you know is we're spending quite a bit of time on the framework and on our Slack channel, you had 4,000 people interested in the framework and 100 people interested in what Slockit had to offer as a, as, a, as a corporate company. So the deal really took a life on its own. So what we did is we created this framework and we made, available, made it available to everyone to use and deploy. And a group of people um, from the community um, deployed a bunch of these. And one of them had some ideal optimal parameters for us because it corresponded exactly to our framework, which meant entirely fair. And we decided to make an offer to build this sharing economy network, if you will, that we call the universal sharing network um, for the Dell as a, as a product, as a service, uh, both really. Um, and that's how it all started. And as you can tell, the deal worked out really well. Okay, so, so, to, so to recap, like there are two main entities, which is one is Slockit. So Slockit, as I understand it, is uh, a game behind registered in Germany, right? Yeah, so, GmbH, yeah. Yeah, so um, that is like part, like its own structure is part of the legacy legal system, right? It is governed, governed Completely by... Completely is, yeah, especially in Germany, very strict laws and regulations. Very strict laws and regulations, and people who don't know, game behind is like one of the forms uh, that you could register a company in Germany. There's the other form called the AG, um, and uh, and and the DAO is a separate entity. Completely, um, yeah. Completely, which li lives entirely on the Ethereum blockchain, right? Correct. And uh, both of these entities, like both of these companies, were triggered by people were triggered by people in your team. But your team? No, that's no, no, no. Only the GmbH was built by us, and the DAO was built because I, I heard you reference that early on in the in the show. You mentioned, um, you know, I was one of the people starting the DAO. Actually, I wasn't. Um, you know, we we rewrote the code for that powers the DAO in the sense that we wrote a framework that anyone can spawn. So in our minds, what we would see would be a a, a car DAO and um, a, a, a rental agency DAO and whatever farming equipment DAO and a in this case, a sharing economy DAO. Um, and that's that's what we hope to form, is a network a constellation, of, if you will, of DAO that people uh, spawn. And the reason why we thought that was important is because a lot of people talk about DAOs. If you look at the Wikipedia page, the place where we did our initial research, I mean, the whole thing is just pure nonsense. I mean, it just doesn't describe at all principles of, uh, of a DAO that would actually be functional in the real world. And that's why we put a lot of research into it, how to protect people from the minority from the majority, for example, so-called 51% attacks and all sorts of security and um, social attacks um, that we had to bake into the framework, or at least bake protections from these attacks into the framework and then make it available. And then the community spawned this DAO, um, but we'll spawn many, other, uh, many others, I'm sure, after the success of this first one. Okay, so I, I get I get that the, the DAO is something completely different from Slockit and it was triggered by com community members, like it was deployed by community members. Part of the code was written by one uh, Christoph Jens, who is uh, also a part of the co-founding team of Slockit, right? But the deployment and the right. management of the DAO is entirely a separate, it's a separate entity from Slockit. I'd say, imagine if somebody if somebody was uh, pissed off at Kickstarter and wanted to do their own Kickstarter, and I think some uh, quite a few people did actually build alternative crowdfunding platform, and then they go and they deploy it on their websites, and one of them might realize, hey, you know, this is actually a really good framework. I think it happened. I think the guys from Space Citizen did that and then make it available as a framework for others. So in this case, what we did is we build it down and we make it available as a framework for others, but we were also interested in benefiting from the existence of a DAO because we think it's a superior model to the Kickstarter model or the VC model in order to start a project with rather, whether if the entity purchase product and services from us and have that client supplier relationship, but also give you know the, the leeway for people to write their own proposals to a DAO that may include other things than just products and services. It could include, um, I don't know, providing maybe equity in exchange of ether or things of that nature. Okay. 
so per- perhaps like like we we like to explore uh, the relationship between slocket the dao and uh, this other third company that i keep hearing about which is dao link yeah later on in the show but let's let's just start first with the dao itself because it's a new concept and our listeners would like to learn more about it and then it's perhaps easier to fit slocket and dao link later on in the exactly. show exactly step around. at a time you know yeah step at a time <laughs> so like what would you say uh, can you describe the dao and what what would be the vision of the dao itself Well, I mean, the, what's interesting about the DAO and the DAO framework in particular is that the code has been audited by um, the company that audited the Ethereum code base called Dejavu, one of the best, if not the best, in my opinion, auditing company for smart contract in the world at, at this present moment. It's been audited by the community. Um, it's been, a, you know, 3,000 pairs of eyes, or at least at the very least, I think there's 5,000 people on Slack now. Um, and it's been audited by some of the best people in crypto, including Vitalik Buterin, so the inventor of Ethereum, and of course our, our advisor Gavin Wood, the um, former CTO of, of Ethereum and current uh, founder of Ethcore, as well as um, the so-called father of, uh, of Solidity, um, Christian Wrights Wissner, um, who, who basically wrote the language that, that, that makes the smart contracts even possible. Um, so. The first thing I would say that makes the DAO very different is that its code is well understood um, by uh, a large group of people that are trustworthy. And in that sense, it becomes trustless, right? And that's really what makes this whole thing different. Um, it's the trustlessness aspect. You don't have to trust me that the DAO does this, this and that. You can go and read the code. And if you don't trust the code, you can go and get the opinion of other people. If you can't read code, you can maybe get the opinion of a professional advisor or just, you know, maybe you're happy with the opinion that you find on certain forums. It's up to you, really, the level of trust that you want to have with that organization. But it's the most trustless one out there. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing I would say that makes it interesting is that it's currently entirely fair. So 100% of the tokens, um, and the tokens, by the way, give it its brains, right? Its voting power is driven by, by those tokens. 100% of the tokens belong to the people that made the DAO possible, right? Not me, not Vitalik Buterin, not anyone else. Um, if we wanted ourselves as individuals to own DAO token, we would have to go and purchase them with our own you know, Bitcoins or Ether or whatever. Um, I think that's really important to understand because there's a lot of uh, projects I'm seeing out there that call themselves DAOs and actually are just centralized things where people think, hey, you know, free money because right now there's a bit of excitement around around the field of crypto. So the fact that it's fair and the fact that it's trustless makes makes it unique. Uh, and so the, the DAO itself, so you mentioned that Slocket had... Uh sort of initialized development on this framework and then it was just taken over by the community and the community deployed it. Are there any other DAOs right now other than the DAO uh, that have been deployed? And There's a bunch of test, uh, test DAO that were deployed, some of them on the main net, some of them on the live net. Um, you know, the way things work, everything in life is on a Pareto curve, right? You know, those curves that go a bit uh, boomerang shape, if you will, on the X, Y axis. And so obviously the main one, the DAO, um, as it's called, um, is the one that receives all the attention. And because there's value um, in having this DAO um, holding a lot of ether, um, and the more ether it holds, the stronger, the stronger it gets. Actually, it became sort of the one, right? Um, actually uh, lived up to its name. Um, because the more ether is inside this, this DAO, um, the more projects the DAO can invest into or purchase or you know, obtain services from or donate to if they're charity services, maybe to uh, donate to the further development of, uh, of, of the Ethereum network, its underlying network, uh, which obviously has indirect benefits to it. Um, it can do a lot of things. And the more, the more money, if you will, it has, uh, the more powerful it gets. So there's an, intre- there's an advantage to always go and, and put your Ether into the biggest one. So you get this sort of noble effect going on. Yeah, well, I mean, you you mentioned that this one was uh, sort of geared towards the sharing economy. Yes. Uh, do you do you anticipate that you know maybe there's a DAO for like farming or there's a DAO for you know, some some other uh, niche uh, where you you may see that same amount of traction or like because I mean this 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 DAO raised uh, over 150 million dollars I think, which is a substantial amount of you know dollars in ether, which is a substantial amount of money. Do you think that the amount of success that this you know, initial DAO had, the DAO, uh, can 
you know, can also uh, see the same sort of success in, in other areas? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think what's going to happen is that at the moment, um, a lot of people, I mean, at the, very, at the beginning of the project, actually, people described Vidal as being this um, amoeba-like shape, <laughs> so having no shape. Um, and I think a lot of people had a, a problem with that, and, and rightly so. You know, in a company like Apple, you know that tomorrow they're not going to produce farming tools uh, because its shareholders, in this case, the DAO, to the DAO to token holders, um, well, you know, they know that the brand for Apple is iPads and things of that nature. So yeah, you'll have the iWatch and whatnot, but you won't have, um, you know, the iFarming tool. <laughs> so a lot of people were worried that the DAO having no shape at the beginning and no real mm, cohesiveness, if you will, um, uh, made it too vague. And what they're starting to find is that the proposals that are submitted to the DAO are very much in line with uh, the Slocket proposal. Uh, and you know, ideally, yeah, well, there's no guarantee of it, but ideally the Slocket proposal would pass um, in order to deliver this, uh, this universal sharing network. And some people are submitting proposals for insurance, for example, insurance over the universal sharing network or USN for short. Other people are, are talking about, hey, you know, we need light clients for this, um, these little Ethereum computers to exist. So give me money so that I can go and develop that. Um, so we're seeing that actually it's starting to take shape into this sharing economy related um, DAO because people understand that there are network effects and synergies between this project, just like any VC will have synergies between its different um, sort of projects and its stable of projects, if you will. So I think it's going to get a shape and I think, yes, there will be other DAO. You bet there will be. Um, I think this year, you know, people we're surprised to hear about 150 million plus dollar. Um, I think we're well on our way for next year to see a billion dollar project in crypto. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Really, that that's a, an, an ambitious uh, objective, a billion dollar DAO. I mean, that I, I don't think it's it's necessarily unlikely that it'll happen. Uh, but I think that there needs to be some some company backing it to to get to a billion dollars there needs to be some investment in marketing and i wanted to ask you about that so how much uh, w what do you attribute the success of this campaign because there was there was sort of a campaign around it there was a lot of a lot of time mean, not only from the community's point of view but you know slocket went out and spoke at conferences and things like that um how much of the success of this DAO would you attribute to Slocket uh, sort of pushing it as, as, you know, as an initial DAO project and the community's work in, in trying to raise awareness about, about this DAO? Mm. Um, not that much, actually. I mean, certainly not to the 150 million plus that it currently has collected. I mean, um, if you were to ask a traditional company, hey, how do we raise 150 million bucks? They would tell you, we need to go see a PR company and, and, hire, you know, and pay two or three million dollars at the very least, maybe probably even a lot more than that. I, don't, I know very little about PR. So I imagine they would need maybe 10 million dollars for a campaign where they would have ads on the Super Bowl and whatnot. Um, you know, the, the, clearly that didn't happen here. Um, I think what's, uh, there's, there's, there are two factors um, that are uh, linked to the success of this project. So the first one is people can see that it's fair and it's secure. Um, these are the two major um, advantages, as I said earlier, in terms of its code. Um, the second thing is I think a lot of people um, have been quite vested in Ether. And as the price of Ether went up, they thought, well, you know, I could always put 10% of my Ether holdings into this project or other projects, like, you know, there's, there's plenty others out there. Um, and they felt more comfortable with that, which helped with the, um, the amount of, um, of Ether injected into the DAO. Um, the other thing I think is, so I, there's, there's the snowball effect that we touched on earlier. Um, but also um, in terms of, um, um, the, the, the project itself, um, we're seeing a lot of community support for it. So when you have 4,000 people, 5,000 people, 6,000 people all promoting this to their friends and their families, that really, really helps the project. And we're going to see this translated to the companies, the startup that the DAO will support. Um, because obviously these guys will be A, early adopters, B, um, they'll have the, the, the back of the DAO and of its project through social media, understanding the local culture and so on. Um, I think there's 11,000 account holders now. I mean, I could be wrong. 
I mean, 11,000, even they were only 10,000, that's insane. I mean, in terms of you know, how big of a social media team you really need to beat that, it's unbeatable. And that's why I think the DAO has very good prospects going forward. Let's take a short break and talk about Hi.me. Hi.me is a VPN provider. And if you don't know yet why you should need a VPN provider, let us help you. I'm sure you were like me and when all the crazy revelations came out during the Snowden time uh, of all the, the spying that is being done by the NSA and other government agencies, you were shocked and you said, not with me, not with my own rights. Now, the way government agencies can spy on you, there's many of them, but the most Easiest way is by simply going to your ISP and getting all your traffic, capturing all your traffic. And the VPN can protect you from that. It can give you a secure tunnel from your computer to any of the exit nodes all over the world so that all your traffic goes to this secure pipe that's encrypted and cannot be intruded on. And with Hike.me, you can choose any of their, their 30 exit nodes all over the world so you can enter the internet in a secure location. The best thing about Hide.me is that they have a free plan, which includes two gigabytes of unthrottled bandwidth per month. So you can go to Hide.me slash Epicenter to create your free account. And when you use that URL, you'll automatically get 35% off if ever you decide to go premium. Now the premium plans are really great. They include unlimited bandwidth, access to all of the 30 exit nodes that Hide.me provides, and you can install it on up to five devices at a time. So you can have this running on your phone, your tablet, your computer at work, your personal computer, and just be completely protected all the time. And of course, Hide.me accepts Bitcoin. So we'd like to thank Hide.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So uh, let, let us kind of describe uh, the different, different roles people could take in the DAO. So as I, as I see it, um, there is like, investors slash DAO token holders, right? People who uh, own tokens of the DAO. Then mm -hmm. there is this thing called the curator, right? Uh, and uh, and then and then there are the proposal makers. I mean, Slocket is just one of them. So describe to us roughly who, what do the token holders do? What do the curators do? And what do the proposal makers do? Yeah, sure. Um, so the DAO token holders, what they do is that they vote, right? Um, the way to think about the DAO is it's this um, um, sort of very weak AI that incentivize humans to go and find the best projects out there for it to put its ether into. Okay, so that's how it's a DAO. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, today we don't have strong AIs that can go and make investment decisions in, in companies. So what it does is it har harness, if you will, the, 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 the wisdom of the crowds, the DAO token holders. So the DAO token holders kind of like tools for the DAO actually really um, for, for it to, to, to be able to succeed by giving their opinion, by promoting it, like I said earlier, by being early adopters for its project and by lending it their brains to go and find interesting projects to vote on. Um, so that's what the DAO token holders do. They vote and then obviously they hope, I imagine, to see some benefit out of this whole venture. It's a for-profit DAO, this one. I mean, they don't all have to be for-profit, but this one is. So imagine they want to see some ether back right um, so that's what they do the second role would be the um, the proposers if you will right the guys that submit proposers so proposals so in a client supplier relationship they would be the supplier they build products they build services um, they offer stuff to the DAO for profit not for profit it could be anything right each proposals is defined into a, a smart contract itself and it's, it's the smart contract that gets signed by the DAO and defines the rules of engagement, if you will, with the contractors. And so that, completely, that can vary dramatically. In our case, we have an interesting model of monthly payment. So if we don't do our job, we can get fired. Someone could have another model where they say, just trust us because we're well known in the community and give us a big fat paycheck and we promise we'll deliver a product. If the DAO wants to engage in that, the Kickstarter model, they can. Um, you could have a completely simulated Kickstarter model. I don't think it's a very good idea, but it's possible where they would get uh, the, the, the people voting would get early rewards or things like that. Or you could have people voting on a proposal that give them equity into a real life startup once we establish that bridge between the two worlds, right? Um, 
that's the role of um, the, the DAO token holders and of the, the, the people submitting proposals. And then your third group is the curator. Now the curator tends to be, and it doesn't have to be, but probably is going to be in each, each case a multi-sig of people. And it gives, it gives the DAO a bit of a shape, you know. It tends to be, I, mean, I imagine if you have a, a DAO around racing, racing cars, you'd, you would have a famous um, driver. You would have somebody from one of the Formula One stables or at the helm of one of them, uh, you know, being a curator, lending its name to the DAO. But really, the job that they do is very limited. It's a, it's, it's a bit of a crappy job, actually, to be honest. They don't get paid, so the DAO doesn't pay them. Uh, what they do is they look at proposals and they say, right, the code is the code's okay. Uh, it is what it is in the blockchain. So they validate that the byte code matches the source code. That's the first step. That's the, the first thing they do. And the second thing they do is they establish that this isn't an obvious uh, ripoff. So, for example, it's not a project that's going to take 51% of the fund to then send 100% of the money to something else. You know, like it, it needs to be serious proposals that are passed in front of uh, the DO token holders. And they add uh, the address of the proposers, the, the, the Ethereum address of the proposer, to a whitelist that can receive money for this DAO. And it's implemented that way because at the moment, as of DO version 1.1, it's the ultimate fail-safe in terms of security versus social attacks, which are very, very hard to predict. And we have some very smart people on our team, but they can't predict everything. Unfortunately, they left their crystal balls at home. So um, we had to have this mechanism of creators um, to be able to to back up, back the DAO, if you will, in case of social attacks that couldn't be defined in code. And in this case, the, the initial uh, curators that are... Uh, listed on the DAO website, who picks them? Who decides? Is it the is it the people who initially deploy the DAO, or do they just? How, how does that work? Yeah. So ideally, in a, in an ideal world where you don't have chicken and egg situation, it's the people that um, well, it self forms, if you will. So people people raise their hand and say, "Oh, I want to be a I want to be a curator." So it goes to the person who's already a curator, and the curator adds them to the multi sig. And somebody who's already a creator can say, "You know what? Uh, I'm not getting paid. It's getting a lot of attention on me that I don't need. I'm busy. I have a work to do." Um, and they can leave. Um, it's it's harmless. I mean, it's normal, in fact, for people to come and go as part of the creator list. Now, as I said, chicken and egg problem, the DO didn't have anything. So what we did is that because of our contacts in the industry, you know, with some of the best people in the field um, that were kind enough to accept to be curators, probably before they realized this thing would be as large as it got, right, um, kindly agreed to become uh, the first initial set of curators for this one DAO. So you got Vitalik Buterin in there, you had recently Gavin Wood, you had you have Christian Reitz Wissner, you have all sorts of very smart people like Vlad Zemfir and Victor Tron and people that are really into this stuff and they did it because they felt, well, you know, this is an interesting project. Um, I think ultimately though, um, and sorry guys, but I think ultimately I personally see them disintermediated. I mean, the only role they serve is to act as a fail-safe for something that one day will be able to be achievable with code, with pure code. So my hope is that we're going to fire these guys as part of a DEO 2.0 framework that will be entirely run by computers. But we keep in mind that they themselves don't have much of power right now. If they were to become evil and somehow collude with a, a proposal supplier, um, they would get they could get fired by the people, um, the DEO token holders that would immediately recognize them as a threat. So they can be fired easily. They don't get paid much. Their role is limited to something that one day computers will be able to be. My gut feel, one day they're going to end up like Uber drivers, you know. So you mentioned Gavin Wood. Uh, he recently wrote a Medium post in which he says that he resigns as curator yeah. and sort of uh, urges those who placed Ether to look under the DAO, look beyond the faces and the research structure, etc. Yeah. And can you, and, and warns people that uh, perhaps uh, you know in, in in putting money in this DAO wasn't such a 
good place to put your ether. Can can you hmm. comment on That's that? And, and actually not what he said. I mean, did, Gavin did, told did us I, two I, days. Did I get that wrong then? <laughs> you got definitely reread okay. the blog post. Um, so two days before he, uh, he, he, he left as a curator, um, Gavin kindly contacted us um, to say, hey guys, you know, I'm getting uh, uh, people telling me, hey, you know, did you buy a yacht recently or do you have a plane now? You know, and I'm getting myself and Christian and all these guys are getting the same sort of crap by people who do not understand that actually what's holding the ether is the DAO code. And I think that's a lot of people having a mental block with this. A computer program that holds $160 million, it doesn't quite register. So immediately they think, nah, it's not possible. Gavin Wood is holding all the money and he's probably buying himself nice Armani suits. Uh, fact is, as I said earlier, he's not getting paid. He was getting a lot of flack because he's quite, you know, well recognized in the community for being a, a, a curator because people thought he was rich somehow. Um, so um, he said, you know what, that's yeah, as much as I love the project, um, I'm out because I had enough of this. And if you read the code, uh, well, if you're, sorry, if you read the blog post that he wrote, he's actually very supportive of the project. Uh, he's supportive of Slocket in general, and he continues to be, in fact, one of our advisors at Slocket. Um, is he right to say to people, hey, go and read, read that source code? Hell yeah, go and read the source code. I have the same warning if you want to call it that to people. Never trust others. Always check out the bytecode. Always do your homework. Always ask people, hey, is this valid code or is this taking some of the tokens and putting them in someone's pocket? Um, if you go and check out the DAO, you'll see that actually it's 100% fair and Gavin would be the first one to agree with that. Okay, that's, that, that's very interesting, right? Like it's, it's probably the first time that we have a governance mechanism that uh, that mediates how a lot of people uh, collaborate with each other and that governance usually we have had governance mechanisms but we used to have another human to govern other humans or a set of humans to govern other humans it's the first time we have a piece of code or a software program that serves as a governance mechanism for, for humans so it is something that is truly groundbreaking as a, as a, as a conceptual idea itself Today's magic word is token, T-O-K-E-N. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Now, um, like one of the one of the interesting questions that comes to my mind is the the DAO itself is decentralized and autonomous. But it interacts with uh, with services in the world that are inevitably centralized, and I'm wondering how how this interface works. So let's take a simple example: Twitter accounts. Now the the DAO quote unquote um, has a Twitter account. The DAO quote unquote has a Slack um, has has a Slack. So who is the administrator of the Slack account? Who is the administrator of the Twitter account? How do these how, how did these like you know they're really assets of the the DAO right that's something that's that wants to be decentralized and the Twitter account though needs to have a one particular owner right so how how, how does this interface get made and who, who picked them yeah chicken and egg again um, so once the DAO is deployed um, they they will be I mean in fact there already are multiple numerous proposals some good, some bad, um, to go and provide the services that you described to the DAO. So there's a proposal right now of a group of people that are um, admin on the Slack because they were part of the community early on. And they're saying, hey, you know, we might as well get paid for, to do this job. So they're banding together and they will submit a proposal to the DAO to uh, maintain a media presence. Um, you know, it would be nice for the DAO to be able to reply to journalists, but it can't because it's a computer program. So what it needs to do is it needs to hire people to do that on its behalf. Um, so it will sign off on proposals that will include media, PR, community, social, you name it. Um, and that's how, that's how it does it. At the moment, uh, it's entirely run by volunteers, just like any other. You know, Slack is free. Actually, um, at the Slack that belongs to the DAO is our old Slack. We just gave it away. We changed the name from Slack to the DAO. That was it. And I say, yep, that's it. It's the communities. Off you go. Um, in terms of those interactions, you raise a very good point, though. Um, which is, well, you know, it works for maybe small things like, um, hey, make me a logo or, hey, we need some press because New York Times said something bad about us or something like that. 
But it, you know, what about the big proposals, right? What about the legal related proposals? What about the circuit proposal itself? You know, the big stuff that will run potentially into the millions of pounds. Um, that's obviously where we can introduce this concept of Darling that we were talking about earlier. So Darling ex exists because we ourselves as Locket, we immediately recognized that we wanted to make a serious proposal to the DAO, a proposal that would last two, three years long, right, in terms of the amount of work that needs to be delivered. We're GmbH. As I said earlier, we live in a country where the regulations are super tight and it's the German administration, you know, they are pretty serious about their regulations. And so we had to build this bridge because we ourselves cannot issue an invoice to something that doesn't have an address, right? Yeah, as in, as yeah. in meaning like, like you want to be a contractor to the DAO, right. you want to be a service provider, right? So right. in your income statement, you're going to get some ether. So that has to show as revenue in your income statement. So the German tax authorities or some authorities are going to ask, where did you get this revenue from? Exactly. As, the way I think of it is, as per German law, you aren't allowed to get revenue from an entity that doesn't have a real world postal residential address or let's say head headquarter address or something uh, like that. It's not exactly no. that. No, I mean, it's more of a case of you can't receive money from people you don't know. <laughs> it's just, Common sense, I suppose. Uh, it's how the world works, right? Yes. Um, so that's why we created this uh, this organization called DEO Link. And DEO Link is a residence in Switzerland. Um, and in Switzerland, they have a much more interesting set of flow for the people who are into crypto. My gut feel is that Switzerland is going to get all the entrepreneurs for crypto for the next that say two to three years and it's gonna start a brain drain if you will from france germany britain the united states wherever else people moving to switzerland in order to operate those companies because at the moment it's the only country that has a very friendly set of regulations around the aos as they are um, and crypto in general i mean you know that ethereum uh, was uh, and continues to be actually based out of Switzerland in the Zoo Canton to be specific. Uh, plenty of other projects are located there, including Dio Link. So what Dio Link offers is a bridge between this world of DAO and the world of uh, regulation that I live in. Um, so what we'll do is we'll invoice Dio Link, which has a physical address, and Dio Link will engage into a smart contract with the people in the DAO. Because in Switzerland, you do not need a written paper um, that says that you're engaging with someone into a contract, just the intent of having a contract, which can demonstra be demonstrated in code, is sufficient to establish a legal relationship. So in Switzerland, for example, if you receive 3,000 pounds a month um, in your bank account from the same company over a year, then you can totally go to court and say, I was employed with these people, even though you never signed a, a physical contract. Now that's very, very unique to Switzerland. You can't do that in Britain. You certainly can't do that in Britain. You can't do that in, in, in Germany or as far as I know, pretty much everywhere else. Um, I could be wrong about the everywhere else part, but I know Switzerland is, they get it. You know, they understand this is the future and they're willing to adapt. So, so then DA Link is a company that was started by yeah, sort of Slocket, the, the Slocket team? Uh. It was started by, uh, so it's a, a joint venture between Slocket GmbH and in an exchange called bity, B -I -T -Y .com, um, who have a very solid legal understanding of the local regulation, very good contacts with people that are actually uh, helping uh, shape this, uh, this, this juris jurisdictional environment, if that's a word, I'm not sure, I'm not a lawyer, as you can probably tell. Um, and they've done their homework because they're already an exchange, they audited by KPMG and so on. Um, so that's a match made in heaven. You know, the people that have built the DAO framework and the people that uh, understand how to apply this stuff in the physical world and have the right contacts and the right, have done the right groundwork in order to make it possible. I think DEO Link, we're going to hear a lot more from in the coming six months, 12 months, something like that. Okay, so then DEO Link, uh, uh for you as Slock, it ser only serves the purpose of sort of being the intermediary between uh, the the DO and and your company. If you, if the DO this accept your proposal, uh, you'll be invoicing DO Link, and DO Link will be accepting money from the DO. That is correct. Okay, that's that's interesting. That that you'd have to, well, I mean, it's interesting that it's set up that way, but that you need that sort of intermediary uh, to do that. And my, so what, I guess, wh why, why did you 
create Slocket in Germany then and not in, in Switzerland? Wouldn't that be easier? No, because um, it's a completely different business. Um, I believe, you know, Dio Link will be a successful company of its own. I believe that it's going to look into a lot of things. So one of the things it's going to look into is how can a DAO uh, take actually real equity into a company? That's what people really want. If you read the forums, they're saying, hey, why can't we take a stake in Slock at GmbH? Why do we have to, uh, you know, buy a product or a service? Well, because for now, that's how the world works. Um, Ether, as you know, is a fuel and it was purchased as a product under the Swiss export laws. Um, so uh, I believe Dowlink has a lot more to offer than just being a bridge between us and, and the DAO token holders and the future uh, proposers, if you will, and the DAO token holders. I think it's going to play a very important role in the crypto space, but it's a separate business from what we do at Socket, which is relating, as I said earlier, to autonomous machines, smart locks, things of that nature. So the two have to be separate. And plus, you know, my two co-founders are German and live near Berlin, so it um, makes no sense. They have plenty of children. I also have kids. They're big now, though. Um, and, you know, it makes sense to be based where we want to live dowling seems really interesting uh let's 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 just drill down into this a bit so mm -hmm. um uh, the first thought that came into my mind when i when you described it is uh dowling could conceivably take not just lock it as a customer but other companies in other jurisdictions around the world that want to make proposals to the dow as customers so it becomes sort of let's say like you had bitpay right when whenever a, a merchant wanted to accept bitcoin bit bitpay would uh, make sure that they they got fiat and the the customer could pay in bitcoin dowling is something similar it's like the uh, let's say the bitpay of DAOs where any anybody who wants to get money from the, the dao or other DAOs could just go to them sign a contract with them and then receive money from from dowling if their proposal gets passed yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, I think um, you're starting to see where this is going. It's very, very exciting. There's already people that intend to submit proposal to the DAO that have contacted Dalink and say, hey, you know, we want to work with you because we want to do things by the book. Help us with that. Help us with regulation. Help us with uh, importing export laws. Help us with all the legal framework that comes with this stuff, which has held back. This is what's holding back the ecosystem, by the way. What's holding back the, well, there's two things that hold back the ecosystem. The first one is this stuff is pretty damn complicated. And so um, in order to be a coder, you have to learn solidity and all that. It's not really user friendly just yet. That's the first thing, not enough developers. The second thing is the jurisdictional, ah, juris, juristical aspect of this stuff, um, which is holding entrepreneurs back from getting into this. They think, ah, yeah, I could do the that way, oh, fine, but, um, looks exciting this crypto stuff but uh, I don't want to spend uh, all this money building a legal framework just for this one project you know what I'll just go on Kickstarter let's go uh, or I'll just go get VC money let's go um, it's what's holding people back and we want to fix that and that's what the link which doesn't even have a website yet by the way we haven't done enough way enough marketing on it but we're about to start in the coming month as I said um, is is trying to resolve um, as a as a as an aside, I was at the um, national uh, French National Assembly uh, three months ago, or two two and a half months ago, I believe. Yeah, we're on um, the same on the same panel. <laughs> so you remember then um, how receptive the audience was. I mean, this was the French National Assembly. That's as high as it gets in the pecking order of uh, uh, of legal aspect in France, right? This is where laws are made. Um, and these guys were very receptive. And at the, at the end of the, the little talk, you know, I was walking around the little reception they were having and people, including uh, some, some French deputy approached me and said, you know what, absolutely right. People left France 20 years ago because we were stuck up with a mini tail and we didn't make it easy for these guys to, to work on the web. We don't want to miss the blockchain revolution. revolution. We need to go and make uh, good regulations for these, uh, for these entities so they can be based in France. And why? Why? Why simple? Because they're going to pay tax and that's going to go into the French uh, bank vault, if you will. So they're, they're, they would love that. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, right now, Switzerland has the lead. So I look forward to France, the UK, Germany to start waking up and say, we need to make it easier for blockchain entrepreneurs to work. No, uh, so regard, regarding, regarding France, I mean, 
there, there is sort of a double discourse there, I think, anyway, being in France and having a, a blockchain startup there is that uh, on the one hand, I think that the French government is very much interested in learning more uh, about how blockchains can sort of shape the, uh, the French economy in the coming years. But, you know, as we know, in France, things do take a long time to implement and, and, and for laws yeah. to change. And for anybody who is interested in knowing what a Minitel is, you should definitely check it out. Uh, it's an interesting, <laughs> it piece of awesome. history, an interesting piece of internet history that I didn't live, but that uh, Stefan definitely probably did. Um, yeah. So let's talk, about, let's talk about the proposal process uh, coming back mm. to the DO. Uh, can you walk us through how uh, a project would make a proposal to the DO and the different steps yeah. and voting and all that stuff? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, well, now's the right time to, I mean, if you guys have projects, the guys watching us have projects and you are thinking of doing a crowdfunder of some sort, or if you were thinking of getting a VC, now's the time to actually look into the DAO and think, hey, maybe that's an option. So how do you do this? Well, the first step is you contact the curators. Um, there's going to be a form on the DO Hub website that's going to be created to make that process a lot easier. But right now, you know who they are. Just go on the website. You'll have their Twitter handles. Just send them a message and say, I want to make a proposal. Right? And send them the proposal, send them the bytecode address, obviously, send them the source code on GitHub, I imagine, or whatever service you like, or you want a text file, doesn't really matter, really. And so they can verify you. And once they verify you, they'll add you to the whitelist. Well, that's that's easy because you know we assume that that's just a step to avoid obvious cameras from get going in right so once that's done the real work starts the real work is you're gonna have to convince people that your project um, is worth something any any amount right the amount that you ask for the amount that's asked for in your proposal under the conditions that are defined in your proposal and that's really much like any other projects you need to pitch right so suck it to a certain extent you know what we've done in the last six months is we've pitch. Uh, we went to conferences, we went to, uh, we built a website, we, you know, explained what we wanted to do. We wrote a proposal in plain English, an overview, if you will, of what we intend to deliver when we intend to deliver. It's 29 pages long, which I think is um, probably too long for most people. <laughs> um, we would have maybe preferred, in this case, a one-pager from the Kickstarter environment, but here it is, 29 pages of what we intend to do. And then you just supply the code. Um, and once the DAO is deployed in, when is it, eight days now? I think maybe less, it's next Saturday. Um, you just push it to the, to the, to the chain um, and you advertise it and people can go and vote on it immediately. There's a little voting interface that will pop up in Mist or into um, uh, various websites, including DAO Hub, My Ether Wallet and others. Um, even exchanges are working on voting interface for the DAO, by the way, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's it. You go and, uh, you know, people will vote and uh, they'll vote yes, well, they'll vote no. Um, if it vote yes, congratulations, your proposal went through. If they vote no, better luck next time. Submit a new proposal. Let's take a quick break so I can take you to Paris. I stopped into the Ledger offices and met with Eric Larchevêque, Ledger CEO, and he filled me in on the upcoming Ledger Blue. In early 2016, we are going to release the Ledger Blue. This is a personal privacy device which runs on a C2 element, has a touch screen, NFC, Bluetooth, and USB connectivity, and it will be a full-fledged hardware wallet with a second factor validation of the transaction directly on the screen. It will be fully open source, you will be able to add your own apps, and it will also be compatible with Fido second factor authentication. Passwords are going, are going to disappear and it will be replaced by this kind of cryptographically secure authentication. The Ledger Blue will be certified by FIDO and will give you the possibility to log in on any website very easily just by signing a cryptographically secure challenge. Ledger is making hardware wallets easy and convenient without compromising on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So Stefan, um, the, the, DAO, the, the, the DAO looks really great, but the first question I, that came to my mind was, if, uh, if, if I'm, I'm building a product, right? And I have now many options to, to raise uh, funds. I have friends and family, first of all. Mm. I have angel investors. If, if, it, if I need more funds, I have VCs. I have a crowdfunding, the option. And finally, I have the DAO, right? Now. Yeah, you're lucky, though, if you have all five. Yeah, all five. Now, now uh, 
what what kind of uh, worries me about a bit about the DAO is um, let, let's say with with a, with an angel investor. Let's say there's a famous angel investor in my city. Uh, the the route to getting money is to just convince this one guy or just uh, just these two two or three people. Yeah. But the route to getting say five hundred thousand dollars out of the DAO is to perhaps convince like a thousand people that are stakeholders in the DAO. More. More, right? So uh, it's like I have to convince maybe a hundred times more people to get the same money out of the DAO as compared to a traditional uh, source of uh, source of venture funding. Yes. And and this co- and convincing people takes time, right? Like it, it distracts distracts me from building the thing that is my job as an entrepreneur. That's right. So don't don't you think this is this is a problem? No, I don't see it as a problem. Um, you go see a VC, there'll be some set of problems. Um, you know, VCs, uh, the, I'll, 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 let's name uh, common issues with VCs in 2016. They claim to understand blockchain. All they hear is a buzzword, right? So they're putting their money into whatever. They hope something sticks to the wall, right? To, <laughs> to pardon my French. Um, but um, so there's a, that's the first problem with VCs. Kickstarter. Yeah, there's a, there's a few problems with Kickstarter. If you go and look at the horror stories of uh, what can happen with Kickstarters, you'll very quickly understand what the downsides are. You also see that Kickstarter takes a fairly chunky bit of money out of the project to, to do that. Friends and families, you know, friends and families, seriously, is bad. I mean, I personally wouldn't touch it with a 20-foot pole. Um, it's one thing that, you know, you know that nine projects out of 10, um, probably more in the crypto space, are failures. Um, it's, for some people, it can create, and I've read some really, really grim stories about people who lost their family's money because they got very excited about this project and they, they couldn't deliver, unfortunately. Not because they were malicious, but just because that's how the market works. I mean, that has a big downside, especially if you're a very family-focused family sort of guy. I don't know, maybe you don't care. It's up to you. But it's your options. You have options. And the DAO is just one more option. Um, absolutely right. It's going to be hard to pass something uh, through a set of, uh, you know, 10,000 pairs of eyes. That's a good thing. That means the stuff that's going to actually make it through, it's going to kick serious ass. And these guys uh, that are in the DAO, the DAO token holders, as the DAO that we're talking about now, right? They're the early adopters of Bitcoin. They understand this space. They know what's good. They know what's bad. They don't take any... I can't swear on this show, can I? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But they're very astute. Let's put it that way. Um, And that's a good thing. I think it's awesome. I think that's, uh, that's how things should be, in my opinion. Okay, so 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 let's let's have a follow-on question to this one. Uh, what, according to you, is the uh, is the thing that you worry about in the DAO? Like 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 any venture, right? It has uh, it has a lot of underlying assumptions that are baked into it, right? Oh, big time, uh, big time, um, right? <laughs> so what what assumption about human behavior or crowd behavior or etc. or legal system behavior worries you the most about the the DAO? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's any particular worry. There's a, everybody's aware that when we started this thing, did anybody raise their hand and say $165 million equivalent will go into that smart contract code? Um, I can't remember anyone saying that. I do remember one person in particular uh, shooting for $130 million, but I think he was being just maybe um, cheeky <laughs> or facetious. Um, so let's put it that way. Nobody expected this. Um, I think Christoph Jens, who is the inventor of this thing, after all, let's not forget that. Um, if he was in this room, he would say what he often told me, which is, you know, it would have been ideal if we started off a model that maybe receives 10 million, right? Uh, because then we can start looking at what works, what doesn't work, etc. And nobody gets too excited. 150 million, there's a danger that there's too much hype, you know? And if you look at the mainstream media, it's, it's just a big hype train. They don't understand this technology. They write things. They don't particularly... I think even grasp. Um, I had one particular journalist who was just completely obsessed about numbers. They just wanted me to say numbers. So give me numbers, 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 numbers. And they don't care about the underlying technology or why this is important. So that creates a lot of, um, uh, you know, invalid sort of expectations about the project. And one of these invalid expectations is that tomorrow on the 29th, well, not, not tomorrow, well, maybe tomorrow, depending on what time this is released, but at some point, uh, right after the creation of the DAO, uh, that's it. Proposal 
proposals are getting passed and everybody is putting a proposal and it's all very, very well organized and there are governance tools and no, that's not, it, that's not at all how it's going to happen, guys. So we need to be very uh, clear about this, you know, in terms of expectations for me would be we're going to start seeing uh, proposals around governance models. We're going to see proposals around forums that are backed by the ownership of token uh, tokens. We're going to see voting mechanisms um, like uh, Lumio style voting mechanisms being put in place. Uh, existing companies are going to su submit things. Um, new companies are going to submit things. That's not going to happen overnight. That's going to take, I would say, a good three to six months at the very least to go and put in place this governance model. So I wouldn't expect that many proposals to be passed at the beginning. I wouldn't expect the DAO to um, stupidly, if you will, if that, if you can call it that, sort of uh, take all of its ether and boom, stick it into something or uh, six different proposals. That's not how it's going to happen. It's going to take time. The people that are vested in the DAO are smart people. I think a lot of people look at this stuff and you know, it's, it's almost patronizing. Sometimes I read some comments about how it's gonna be a big shouting match and people can't coordinate because it's too many people, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They just you know, these are smart people. These are the people that, that bet on Ethereum, you know. And if you look at some of the people who are vested in there for you know ten million dollars in some cases, if you believe the statistics, um, these are not idiots. <laughs> they know exactly what they're getting into. They're gonna wanna see the right governance tools, they're gonna wanna see the right jurisdiction uh, um, legal frameworks put in place and that could be include the link and they're going to want to see serious proposals um, so to me these are all good things but it's not overnight um, the DAO could take several years to grow and that's a good thing before it even hits DAO 2.0 some people are excited about DAO 2.0 before DAO 1.0 is even launched I mean that's a little bit high pitch isn't it yeah sure sure like, I mean so uh, that that was a that was a really great answer and kind of it, it clarifies the expectations and uh, the, the way the way our listeners can think about it is um, when you when you own uh, when you are a DAO token holder because the DAO is holding Ether you are indirectly also benefiting if the value of Ether rises so as long as the DAO doesn't spend a big chunk of its funds in some bad proposal uh, your Ethers uh, your DAO is holding the Ethers and you'll still get uh, the benefit of that appreciation and on the other side the upside is if these governance issues can be solved and uh, a good process made to fund great projects and they uh, they start producing a return then you have you have your upside right so your your downside is uh, your your floor of your investment is what happens to ether which probably the token holders would have held anyway and the upside might be, be something something even better so they can weather through this uh, adjustment process at least that's that's how i i i think about it yeah, i think a lot of people are you know share that opinion um I'm not an investor, you know, I can't give investment advice, things like that, but that sounds about right. Um, there's a few limits to that model. Um, you know, keep in mind that once the Ether uh, that the DAO holds has been committed to a proposal, um, you know, it's no longer something that you can take out, right? It's locked into that proposal smart contract that neither the DAO nor the uh, supplier have control over. It's the proposal that it mediates between the two party so that ether is locked in if you will so the only ether you can take out of the DAO is the ether that um, hasn't been um, um, locked in in a proposal and you alluded to this you say as long as they don't spend it all in one place right which would be a silly thing to do um, but I, I guess an interesting art project or whatever um, but um, yeah so that's one thing the other thing to remember is that this is still a technical process to be able to extract your ether out of the DAO it takes about I think 21 30 days something like that so it's not immediate um, you know, it's not um, it's not a sure guarantee of anything. Plus, um, you know, we we touched on that briefly, but there's also the risk element around the, the newness of this platform, but also the newness of the underlying Ethereum platform. I mean, Ethereum, you know, is brand new um, in terms of you know, grand scheme of things. It's uh, what six month, seven month old, more, um, not that much old, not that much older. Um, so. I would, um, you know, for people who are risk averse, this may not be a very good place to be. For people who enjoy risk and think, hey, you know, this is an interesting experiment. I want to be part of it. I think it could lead to some interesting governance model and it could lead to some great projects that otherwise wouldn't wouldn't receive attention. And go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so one of the one of the other challenges that I kind of 
so i i read through the code of the dao and uh, uh i i was i was i was like i was thinking of uh, as an investor right like should i should i buy the dao token or not and i mm-hmm. um and i read through the code of the dao and one of the questions that came to my mind is um if if i had a, if i had say let's say i don't know 10 million dao tokens or whatever right um, mm-hmm. whatever big amount um and let's say sebastian had the same big amount right and you had the same big amount all three of us in in the room we had the same amount of dao tokens right now um, all three of us are kind of expected to vote and contribute our knowledge into into evaluating proposals right now um let's say like sebastian works a lot right you know 10 or 20 hours a week and evaluates the proposal and votes and the dao does makes a good decision based on his vote mm-hmm. um let's say stefan you you are somebody who has the nature of okay you know sebastian is good therefore you will vote wherever sebastian votes or something like that so you are you are evaluating at least who is good right don't do that and then by the way <laughs> <laughs> And, and then and then there might be somebody like me who will be like who will be like okay i i don't care i'm i'm just going to buy it and forget it right mm-hmm. yeah right now the, the now the problem i had like is like the payoff uh, the payoff for all three of us is the same yeah if the dao tokens go five times sebastian stefan and meher will make the same money even though meher contributed nothing to it right so, yeah so I I kind of I kind of had the feeling that uh this is like a tragedy this is like a tragedy of the commons problem right because everybody is incentivized kind of not not like the optimal strategy for everybody is to not do any thinking any thought process or any voting and just benefit from the appreciation of the dao token in the hopes that other people other people will do the work for you yeah i see what you mean um well <laughs> um <laughs> that's a very interesting thing if you draw parallels to the real world what happens when people do that usually very 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 bad things happen in terms of governments being elected um that probably don't have the people best interest at heart <laughs> so uh lazy voters are probably not welcome in this project and you're right some people might be lazy and say yeah i trust that the other voters are very smart well wow, that's a lot of trust to put in i mean i personally think you know that they're going to be more vested than what you describe i mean you yourself you said um we all hold a large amount right and you say you don't really want to vote because you see me voting and you think okay he's a good guy whatever um okay well i mean it's it's the same reasoning as you know who votes for the president i don't really care about who the president is because they're, they're left right same same you know pepsi and coke a lot of people think that um you know that it's all the one and the same one party sort of uh, world that we live in so this this is no point voting this is different though because you're vested i mean you have 100 bucks into it and in your case it's something like you had 10 million bucks vested into it i mean if you had 10 million bucks vested into something wouldn't you do a, a, the least bit of uh, due diligence at the very least and to me that sounds like common sense um if you don't uh, expect bad things to happen yeah but a lot i mean i haven't looked at the amount of uh, ether that people are investing in uh, or have, have have put into the dao uh mm-hmm. to purchase tokens but i i, I suppose it's not uh, you know tens of thousands of dollars um and you know to mayor's point i i think that that freeloader problem Mm. may maybe an issue in the long term I and mean, maybe it'll iron itself out uh, you know in, in in a few years if the, if this if this dia was successful but if you look at something like bitcoin if you look at all of the other cryptocurrencies that have come after it uh a, a, a lot of people have their money in there and are not using it they're, they're waiting for something to happen in order for them yeah. to make to make it's it some more though. value I mean, like it I forgot who the guy is uh, Chris Dixon or something like that on Twitter and he wrote um You know the DAO is like for Ethereum. Uh, if Ethereum was a company, the DAO is its R and D department, right? And he, he, somebody else said, "Oh well, it would be nice to have this for Bitcoin." So you know you don't have it for Bitcoin. When you put your money in Bitcoin and you hold it, 
you hold Bitcoin, you hold a currency, it's like uh, holding dollars or holding pounds, right? In the context of the DAO, you know, there's projects coming in that you have to vote on. Now, you're right that a lot of people might say, hey, I, only, I think to your point, uh, the point you're trying to make is the long tail isn't going to vote, right? Because they got 10 bucks into this thing. Sure, maybe they don't. But um, I think the, 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 the short top, whatever they're called, the people at the top, the people that just happened, again, distributed on the Pareto curve. If you look at the stats, um, I think 80 accounts on about 50% of the DAO. Um, these guys are going to vote. Um, and they're going to vote right. They're going to vote the right decision. In the future, it's also possible to imagine a context where you would have delegate voting. That reminds me a bit of proof of stake to a certain extent, where people could delegate their vote to someone else and say, yeah, well, you know, IBM has just announced that they're going to be, they have a lot of those tokens. And we think IBM is a very good DAO, DAO token holders because they have the means of doing due diligence. So we'll roll with that. Or maybe um, this very famous uh, guy uh, in the crypto space that I'd love to follow. I listen to all the, blog, the, the podcasts you know he said he had a lot of that token and he gave the address so what i'll do is i'll set it so that automatically my vote goes to whatever he does i think that's kind of cool actually that would be a really cool experiment to see what happens and i wouldn't see that as a tragedy of the commons at all i would see that as common due diligence and good good common sense okay so let's uh before we wrap up let's come back to to slock it and the ethereum computer that uh, you guys have proposed to build for the dow can you tell us yeah. about the ethereum computer and what it's trying to achieve yeah so the ethereum computer is part of the um set of deliverables um that we have in mind for a proposal which is really to deploy this this thing called the universal sharing network so the universal sharing network the vision is you have a car you can share it you have a house you can share it you have an office you can share it without third party without middlemen um, if on the other hand you somebody wants to rent something you have an app you look at the app and it says right two kilometers to your left there's a 3d printer where you can go and print whatever you know maybe you're an artist and you want to use that or there's a laser cutter which would be kind of nice for the maker space and decentralize the maker space itself you know that kind of stuff so the idea is to share everything and anything and as part of that we have this ethereum computer which is this little piece of consumer electronics which um, mediates if you will objects that don't yet support the blockchain but when they will um, and helps them uh, interact with people that are using the blockchain to rent, sell or share stuff. So for example, it could be a door lock. Now, as you know, there's hundreds, it's probably, I wouldn't say thousands, but definitely hundreds of types of smart door locks out there. Um, there's hundreds, if definitely maybe thousands in this case, of initiatives by large companies like Samsung and so on to build smart objects. So the Samsung smart things, um, the Logitech Harmony Hub, you know, Things like that. Um, so the idea is to help these guys onboard um, the blockchain technology by having this piece of consumer electronics that mediate those transactions in someone's home or someone's office, right? Um, it's one part of the big picture because the big picture is really to have this stuff running on apps and have an app running on a router and the router speaks Wi-Fi and so it can uh, operate an August lock at the door, for example, and maybe that's sufficient. Or maybe there's a Samsung uh, SmartThings hub and that thing speaks Z-Wave and Zigbee. So now all of a sudden, the Slocket app, if you will, the Universal Sharing Network app, would be able to mediate all those objects without the need for an Ethereum computer. So the idea is to have the Ethereum computer as a uh, sort of uh, vanguard into this space. Um, a, a, bit, a, a bit of technology that would really be groundbreaking and demonstrate how useful this technology is. Um, so this piece of consumer electronics sits in your home, talks blockchain and allows people to come in and out by renting and rent your stuff, so rent and sell, share your stuff. Uh, what, what is the barrier to entry for someone who were to acquire an Ethereum computer to have the devices set up on, on this on the system? Yeah, so we, that's exactly what we're trying to lower. So that's part of the proposal, um, to lower the barrier of entry by making objects automatically discover the Ethereum computer or vice versa, probably more like the Ethereum computer discovering objects. So we're working with partners like Noki, for example, which does bike locks and they do um, uh, little padlocks as well. Um, that And, and they, they, the idea is you have on your Ethereum computer display, if you will, whether that's HDMI art or a, a display panel on the Ethereum computer itself, um, uh, a view of the state of those objects and be able to rent, sell or share them and control obviously access, control permission, how much you're going to charge to use this stuff, if anything at 
all because you might just want to make it available to anyone. That's okay too. But just have this sort of governance in place still. Um, so that's that's the barrier of entry would be to um, to have access to objects that recognize it. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to lower. What we're building really isn't an Ethereum computer or an app. What we're building is a network. And that's really important to understand. Building a network means everything we do is open source. The Ethereum computer itself, we're gonna give away all the, the designs, everything. It's gonna, anyone can rebuild one at home if they have the means to, and we're gonna try to make it simple. We're gonna try to make simple versions that run on a Pi for those who just want a simple version. And we're also gonna let the Chinese clone go and, and clone that stuff as well. That's cool too, because the more the merrier, because everything ultimately is mediated by the uh, this USN, and ultimately the DAO benefits from all those transactions that are mediated by these applications, these devices, these routers, whatever they might be. So do you think that, uh, so people that would rent things on the Ethereum computer, or on, oh, sorry, on the universal sharing network, what, what are some of the sort of first things you think people will put on the universal sharing network? What? Door locks. Door locks. Yeah, 100% sure that's the first, that's the first thing everyone looks at. And I don't know what it is with door locks. That's, uh, <laughs> that's so exciting. Uh, but I guess I can think of a lot of exciting stuff, but um, um, everyone that's sort of from a may maybe mainstream sort of point of view rather than crypto point of view say, oh, that's great because then I, don't, I can continue using Airbnb, but at the same time, I get this sort of uh, sidetrack, if you will, where I can actually rent things directly on top of my existing Airbnb or whatever other app they may be using, right? Um, and that sort of gives them a way out. That gives them that sort of opening of the door. And the next time somebody comes into their house, they'll use the USN rather than use the Airbnb uh, approach. I mean, the universal sharing network is, uh, is, like, is like a brilliant vision. Uh, and I like to actually describe this vision a bit differently. And huh? uh, and uh, and like talk about a, 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 like a different way of seeing it, and I like your opinion on it, right? Because this is what I've been using when people ask me about Slocket, and out here in in some of the meetups in Switzerland. So um, so the way I, I like I, I tend to think of it is the you the what Slocket score technology is a way of mapping physical objects mapping the ownership of physical objects in the real world to smart contracts on Ethereum. So as a first approximation, you, you start to think that a physical object, uh, let's define that the a particular smart contract on Ethereum is the owner of the physical object. And then once that smart contract is the owner, it can sell it, sell, rent, or do anything uh, with that physical object. It can rent it to other people so that other people can use it for the time being. Right? So you're mapping all of the objects in the world to smart contracts on Ethereum that can kind of interact with each other at one level. And then also like the brilliant part about this idea seems to be, to me, that if you look at DAOs, right? DAOs, if you think of them as organizations, today they can own Ether. They might be able to own uh, other kinds of currencies if they issue them on the Ethereum blockchain. But today DAOs find it very hard to own physical assets. If I think of a company like a pharmaceutical company like Novartis, it has a lot of physical assets, right? It has laptops, it has tables, it has benches, it has land, etc. So today DAOs have no way of owning physical assets. But once you start to map the ownership of physical objects as smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain, then DAOs as a whole can own these physical objects or rent these physical objects so you can have these virtual corporations interact with physical capital that's Would... a mind-blowing way to describe it um you know we have some uh some openings at slucket for marketing positions <laughs> you're more than welcome to join uh, <laughs> um, but that's how you would describe it to to a crypto audience yes yes um i'm you know what i'm trying to do and i think this is gonna be a a, a, a very, very, very ambitious goal, very tough proposition is I'm going to try to, to explain what you just said to people who've never heard about blockchains. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of people, in fact, the vast majority of the world, guys, 
don't care about blockchain. They yeah. don't care about blockchain <laughs> just like they don't care about what's uh, powering Facebook. Facebook works. Why do I need to know about it's using Hadoop? I mean, Hadoop is an amazing technology I hear. So what? It, does, it, does Facebook work? Yeah, it works. Okay, so I'll use that. Um, does it bring me value? Does it make me money? These are the questions that uh, the non-blockchain people are going to be very interested in. Um, and in fact, the only questions that people that don't know about blockchain are going to be interested in. So our job is going to be to explain to these guys. And But the way you've described it is just absolutely spot on in terms of vision for the US and long term uh, from a crypto vision. Yeah. And so then tell us about some of the uh, maybe some of the initial pocs that uh, you have been working on with some of your initial partners or at least what you can talk about. Yeah. So um, and again, this is important to understand just for this because I'm used to the questions nowadays. Uh, it's important to understand that what I'm about to describe is very much um, separate from the business that we would have with the DAO with our proposal, right? These are existing clients, just like the DAO is a client. These are other clients. So um, one client in particular that is uh, very um, candid with information is a company called RWE. Um, they're based out of Germany. They have about 30 million customers. So they're an established billion dollar player in the nuclear energy. Um, they operate nuclear power plants and they're hurting. Um, you know, they're hurting because this stuff is getting disintermediated, just like the phone companies got disintermediated this, 10 years ago in most countries in Europe. So um, they're being pulled apart and they're thinking we still need to maintain our profit. We need to find a way to make more money. We need to find a way to lower our costs. We need to stop this, uh, this bleeding, so to speak. And so they see blockchain as a way to incorporate things like faster payments, um, make it easier for people to have access to things like uh, charging your, your electric car. You know, they look about at the future five years down the line and they think a lot of people will have Teslas. There'll be lots and lots of charging stations out there, but they all speak different protocols. They're all different. So you have a card and maybe you can tap on one charging station or insert your card or whatever, but it won't work in the next one. And then when you travel to France, when you bought the car in Germany, and that won't work. Um, so basically the experience will be rotten and rubbish. So um, they're trying to simplify that experience by having a blockchain based layer to simplify all this accounting um, and obviously gain more customer that way and maintain their their market shares that way so it's pretty clever and they're very very candid as i said and forthcoming with information so if you go online you'll see there's a chap called karsten stürker who's their uh, i believe head of blockchain innovation um, who's doing a lot of meetups with ethereum who's explaining a lot of the things they do um, in a completely transparent way and uh, to me that's really exciting because that's the first time i see a billion dollar company that's not a bank looking into this stuff i like that a lot yeah yeah, yeah i mean they so they sponsored uh, a couple of episodes uh, a while back they had this contest oh, uh, did they? your show the, yeah for uh, oh, sweet. for okay, I didn't know that. Um, they had this sort of uh, contest where you know you could submit ideas for blockchain startups and they would fund you you, know, the, the, you, you could win some prize money uh okay so then it, it, then in, in that sense slock it if if you don't win the proposal which you know obviously you know we all hope you you, you do uh then then slock it is uh, sort of consulting with uh existing players on blockchain and iot is is that's where, where you're positioning it as Oh, I mean, whatever happens, we will continue to con provide consulting services and extend our offerings to, um, you know, companies that are interested in this technology, but with a focus, I think, on blockchain plus IoT, because that's where our heart and the passion is, if you will. I'll leave uh, private blockchains for, uh, for banks, for other companies. We're not really into that. Okay, well, thanks so much for coming on, Stefan. It's definitely a very interesting and fascinating topic, uh, and and one of the obviously one of the most uh, established projects uh, in in the smart contract space in terms of mindshare and and, and our money uh, since uh, since it's raised since the DAO has raised uh, qu quite a bit of money, and uh, you know we definitely uh, wish Slocket a lot of well a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, well, to be prosperous in this space. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Great questions as usual. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming on. And again, uh, thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Uh, Epicenter Bitcoin is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can go to letstalkbitcoin.com 
to find all kinds of great shows about blockchains, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, etc. Uh, we release episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday, and you can find those on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, uh, or wherever you get your podcast. And of course, if you're a loyal listener, you can leave us a review on iTunes and send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we will send you a t-shirt. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.